latest headlines for you now this Monday lunchtime with the ITV News. Talks of the harsh reality ahead as the build up to this week's budget gathers pace. Lee Keir Starmer's first in charge, and he says the Tory era of destroying the country's economic foundations is over. Nobody wants higher taxes, just like nobody wants public spending cuts. But we have to be realistic about where we are as a country. Also this lunchtime, fertility rates fall to their lowest level since records began, mirroring declining rates around the world. Racism and vulgarity. Donald Trump's campaign trail hits his hometown, New York. And it's man down at Man United. Eric Ten Hag is out after an abysmal start to the season. This is the ITV Lunchtime News. With Charlene White. Good afternoon. The Prime Minister today warned of the harsh reality ahead as he prepared the nation for what's to come in this week's budget. Sir Keir Starmer said it would be a long and difficult path to his vision of change, but vowed that his government would fix the country's foundations. He also announced that a cap on bus fares in England will rise to £3 in the budget, his first as Prime Minister, and which is expected to include tax rises. With more, here's our political reporter, Jasmine Cameron Chileshi. In Birmingham, the PM began the biggest week of his premiership. Ahead of his first budget, his message to the public was stark. Things are worse than we could possibly have expected during the election. And the budget will set that out very clearly. The PM wants to raise £40 billion through tax hikes and spending cuts. He says to prevent austerity and rebuild public services. We are turning the page on Tory decline, closing the book on their austerity and chaos. And look, nobody wants higher taxes just like nobody wants public spending cuts. But we have to be realistic about where we are as a country. Labour's promise not to raise income tax, VAT and national insurance for employees. But tax hikes in other areas are being considered, including increasing national insurance contributions for employers, increasing inheritance tax and continuing the freeze on tax thresholds. The Prime Minister also confirmed the £2 bus fare cap will increase to £3 until the end of next year. I do know how much this matters, particularly in rural communities where there's heavy reliance on buses. Um, and that's why I'm able to say to you this morning that in the budget we will announce uh, there'll be a £3 cap on bus fares um, to the end of 25. But among the public, the move has been met with some scepticism. Well, if they want to get people on public transport, they should keep the fares low, shouldn't they? It's harder for people that have, like, um, working class jobs and that don't have cars and stuff, so I don't, I don't think it's a good thing. Even as the PM hoped to keep the focus on his budget, he faced awkward questions over the decision by Labour to suspend MP Mike Amesbury, following CCTV footage appearing to show him punching an individual. I've seen the video footage. It's shocking. Um, we moved very swiftly to suspend him uh, as a member and as a member of Parliament. Um, there is now a police investigation, and in the circumstances, uh, you'll appreciate it. There's not much more I can say about that. The government says those with the broadest shoulders will pay the most, but who emerges as the winners and losers of Wednesday's budget will shape the PM's legacy for months and years to come. Thank you very much. Jasmine Cameron Shaleshi, ITV News, Westminster. Oh, we can speak now to our political correspondent, Harry Horton, who was at the Prime Minister's speech. And Harry, it's been a tricky start uh, for Keir Starmer, hasn't it? Uh, but this could be his most significant week so far as Prime Minister. 
Yeah, I think no doubt about it. This is the biggest week so far for Keir Starmer as Prime Minister. And how that budget is perceived on Wednesday will go a long way to determining how successful he can be as Prime Minister over the next five years. And we did get a few more details about what might be in that budget on Wednesday. The Prime Minister confirmed that that three pound cap, that two pound cap on bus fares in England will increase to three pounds. Uh, he also said that he wants to invest more in public services. But to do that would require, he said, some difficult decisions on some uh, government spending. And he also basically admitted that some taxes would have to go up to pay for that. Now, when I asked him whether he was being honest, that that meant that some working people would be paying more in tax, uh, the Prime Minister would only say uh, that working people would see no more tax in their pay slip. Now, Keir Starmer, Keir Starmer emphasised it might take some time for people to feel the impact of these uh, changes uh, after this budget. It has been a difficult start for the government, as you say. Uh, that won't change on Wednesday. I think they will hope uh, that this can be a turning point for them. Okay, Harry, thanks very much. And we'll bring you Rachel Reeves's first budget live on a special programme, the Chancellor's Budget, right here on ITV. Tom Bradby and our team of editors will tell you what it will mean for you, your family and the country. That's from 12.15 on Wednesday. Now, a paedophile who used AI to create indecent images of children before selling them has been jailed for 18 years following what detectives called a landmark case. In some cases, Hugh Nelson used computer software to turn pictures of real children into explicit images. Well, Rachel Townsend is at Bolton Crown Court for us. And Rachel, there have been some really, truly horrific details during this case. Yeah, that's right. The judge in this case said the nature of the content created was utterly chilling. And it has been described as a landmark case because Hugh Nelson used normal, everyday photographs of children to transform them into indecent images. And for the first time, police could link artificially generated images to actual children. And the court heard how Nelson, the graphic designer from Bolton, would have so-called commissioners around the world sending him photographs of children they knew. We know that one was a nine-year-old girl currently living in the USA. Nelson would then charge his network of paedophiles for the images, charging extra to animate them into sexually explicit environments. Well, the judge here said what he created was harrowing and sickening. Police say he was a predator with no control. Without a shadow of a doubt, I think he would have carried on doing this type of offending if he hadn't been caught. Um, he has a sexual interest in children and that is his motivator and therefore um, cannot control that um, and as a result will continue to offend. Um, the nature of his offending um, has demonstrated that the, the, the images that have been created have become more graphic uh, in nature as time has gone on. Well, Nelson admitted he made around £5,000 over an 18-month period and in some cases he encouraged his clients to sexually abuse the children. Detectives say they may never know whether or not that happened. Nelson showed no emotion as he was sentenced to 18 years in prison. Okay, Rachel, thanks very much. Far-right activist Tommy Robinson has been jailed for 18 months after admitting contempt of court by repeating false allegations against a Syrian refugee schoolboy. Robinson, whose real name is Stephen Yaxley Lennon, admitted breaching an injunction put into place after he was sued for libel in 2021. An inquiry has heard that the former Russia spy, Sergei Skripal, told his neighbour that he couldn't go back to Russia because he thought that President Vladimir Putin would get him if he did. Mr Skripal, his daughter Yulia and then police officer Nick Bailey were poisoned with the chemical weapon Novichok or in Salisbury in 2018. The inquiry is examining how Dawn Sturgis died after she was exposed to it. And French actor Gérard Depardieu has asked for his sexual assault trial to be delayed due to health reasons after his lawyers confirmed he will not appear at court for the first day of trial. The 75-year-old actor who denies the charges is accused of assaulting two women on set in 2021.
Manchester United said her sacks manager Eric Ten Hag after a poor start to the season. My reporter Charlie Frost is here. Charlie, this isn't a huge surprise, is it? Well, no, not really. The Dutchman has paid the price after United's dismal start to the season continued with a 2-1 defeat at West Ham yesterday, leaving them in the bottom half of the table. In fact, they've only won one of their last eight games in all competitions. In a statement, the club said they were grateful to Eric for everything he's done and wished him well for the future, confirming that former Manchester United striker and current assistant coach Ruud van Nistelrooy will take over as interim manager while they recruit Ten Hag's replacement. Well, after his appointment in the summer of 2022, Ten Hag managed to hang on to his job at the end of last season, despite a few remarkable defeats, including a 7-0 loss to Liverpool, after he led United to victory in the FA Cup, uh, sorry, uh, beating rivals uh, Manchester City 2-1 to lift the trophy in May. Now, that win meant that uh, co-owner Jim Radcliffe decided to give Ten Hag the benefit of the doubt and a chance to work with the squad over the summer, but they haven't seen the progress that they wanted and it's understood that the decision to sack him was a unanimous one by the club's bosses. Okay, Charlie, thanks very much. The family of former MP Sir David Amos, who was murdered back in 2021, have told ICV News of their anger of being denied the inquest they feel they deserve. Sir David Amos was stabbed to death while holding a constituency surgery in Southend. In her first television interview, his daughter Katie spoke to our political editor, Robert Peston. It's just over three years since the brutal murder of the well-respected MP for South End, where I'm standing, Sir David Amos. Sir David was killed holding a constituency surgery by Ali Harvey Ali, who was posing as one of his constituents. And the, the murder was about the most brutal you can imagine. Now, I've been talking to Sir David's family, his daughter, Katie Amos, in her first television interview. And she feels that the family has never been given the answers to why the authorities did not protect Sir David. She wants the inquest reopened. This is what she told me. There's no accountability and nobody wants to be held responsible. My dad worked for 40 years for his people, for the country, and he is owed the respect of finding out where he was failed, why he was failed, and to make sure that this doesn't happen again. But something weird is going on. You just don't trust the process. Well, no, because everything I've tried to do has failed. These people came to the funeral and were crying and so sad that it had happened. Yet when I need support and to be allowed to, you know, find out what happened, Nobody is anywhere to be seen. Now, there are two big relevant facts here. One is that Ali Harvey Ali, as a teenager, was identified by the head of his sixth form college as somebody who could become an extremist, could become a terrorist. He was put on the PREVENT program, but he was only on it for a few months. The family want to know why he was allowed to drop off the PREVENT program and why, therefore, the security services didn't continue to follow him over the six subsequent years when literally day and night he was plotting to murder an MP. And they also want to know why the local police didn't follow up on a threat to Sir David that was made not by Ali Harvey Ali, it turns out, but by somebody else the night before his murder. So big questions that the family need answering, which is why they are desperate for this inquest to be reopened. And you'll be able to watch Robert Peston's full interview with Katie Amos on ITVX later on today. OK, still ahead, Trump's a controversial New York rally. And a surprise for fans in a Tim Timothy Chamelet lookalike contest. But first, new figures have revealed that the fertility rate dropped to a new record low in England and Wales last year. It continues a trend which has seen fertility rates falling since 2010. Well, our health correspondent Rebecca Barry is here. Rebecca, what's behind the decline then? Well, it could be a number of factors, which I'll come to. As you say, today we got the data showing that fertility rates in England and Wales, that's the average number of children a woman has in her lifetime, dropped to the lowest level since records began. 
Figures from the Office for National Statistics show that last year the fertility rate was 1.44 children per woman. That's the lowest since records started in 1938. There were just over 591,000 live births. That's the lowest number since 1977. Now, this is a trend that we've been seeing in recent decades, and it reflects the picture globally, too. Recent studies have found that some of the reasons are economic pressures, people who are having not found the right partner, or just not feeling ready uh, to try and conceive. The ONS says that there should be a fertility rate of 2.08 for uh, the natural replacement of a population. And with our ageing population, some fertility experts say that these figures should be a wake-up call for the government to try and tackle some of those barriers to parenthood. Okay, Rebecca, thanks very much. Oh. Oh, until America chooses its next president, Donald Trump has fired up his supporters with a star-studied and controversial rally at New York's Madison Square Garden, Hulk Hogan, and the world's richest man, Elon Musk, were among those who took to the stage. But it was what some have called racist comments by comedian Tony Hinchcliffe, which have sparked criticism from all sides. Here's some of what he said. I don't know if you guys know this, but there's literally a floating island of garbage in the middle of the ocean right now. Yeah. I think it's called Puerto Rico. Uh, well, our US correspondent Dan Rivers was at that rally last night and joins us live. Now, Dan, New York was an interesting choice of a location in the first place for this rally, given that Mr. Trump has very little hope of winning the state. Yeah, I mean, this close to the election, I did not expect to find myself in New York City attending a Donald Trump uh, rally. Look, I think this was more about uh, prestige and fundraising for Donald Trump. He's long coveted appearing at Madison Square uh, Garden, that it was about some political strategy. I think he knows he's got no realistic prospect of winning this state in the presidential uh, election. But this was a sort of gathering of the MAGA uh, faithful, uh, about 20,000 people cramming into that auditorium, as you mentioned, uh, seeing uh, the likes of Hulk Hogan, the wrestler, ripping off his T-shirt, as we've seen before at the Republican National Convention. Uh, we heard from Elon Musk, the world's richest man, a, a big donor and backer uh, of, of Donald uh, Trump. But as you mentioned, it, it is those racist comments, those uh, distasteful, uh, offensive comments that have grabbed all of the headlines uh, here today. The theme throughout from Donald Trump really hit two major themes, the economy, but particularly uh, immigration. And here's what he said when he was amping up the rhetoric against illegal immigrants in America. And I'm here by calling for the death penalty for any migrant that kills an American citizen or a law enforcement officer. Those comments that you heard from Tony Hinchcliffe about uh, Puerto Ricans, I think particularly are... Uh, what, what has grabbed the headlines here. I mean, you know, immediately the Harris campaign uh, grabbed onto this and, and, and turned, turned out an attack ad on the back of it. 4% of Pennsylvania's voters are of Puerto Rican heritage. One of uh, the big Puerto Rican uh, stars, Bad Bunny, who has 45 million followers on Instagram, instantly endorsed Harris in light uh, of those comments. But there were plenty of other offensive attacks uh, against Harris herself personally. Uh, so uh, pretty distasteful uh, rhetoric uh, throughout six hours of, of this rally. Okay, Dan, thanks very much. The mother of Matthew Perry has given her first TV interview since her son's death, which was a year ago today. Suzanne Morrison told NBC he'd had a premonition about his death and that there was an inevitability to what was going to happen in the days before he died. The Friends actor, who was 54, died of the acute effects of ketamine. And among thousands of runners at yesterday's Dublin Marathon was actor Colin Farrell for a very personal reason. He pushed his friend Emma Fogarty across the finish line. The 40-year-old is the longest-serving Irish woman with the agonising skin condition epidermal epidermalis bullosa. Now to a question posed to New Yorkers yesterday. Who can do the best Timothy Chalamet impression? Uh, Chalamet, even. well, it turns out nobody does it better than the Wonka star himself. The actor stunned dozens of doppelgangers who'd gathered for a look-alike contest by making a surprise appearance, as Sangeeta Candola reports. 
They're not the real deal, but dead ringers for Timothy Chalamet, causing chaos in New York. These dedicated doppelgangers gathered in their droves, all bidding for the top prize of $50 in this competition. Some sang for the cash. Some came up with irrational reasons for winning. Timothy Chalamet looks like Bob Dylan, and I look like Bob Dylan, and by default, I look like Timothy Chalamet. Others doppelganged their dogs to pay an all. I'm feeling great right now. While some thought they had it in the bag. Where's my 50 bucks? We love you, Tim! We love you, Tim! But only one person stood out. Chalamet! And that would be Timothy Chalamet himself. <laughs> who looked like he'd come in disguise, sporting a new moustache. The June actor gate crashed his own lookalike competition. The event, organised by a YouTuber, had earlier caused pandemonium, with police issuing a dispersal order and slapping organisers with a fine for an unpermitted costume contest. And at least one impersonator was taken away in cuffs. But for the wannabe Chalamets and the eventual real winner, it was well worth it, as the real golden ticket here was a chance encounter with the star himself. Sangeeta Candola, ITV News. Just couldn't make it up, could you? Uh, and finally, a rare African antelope on the brink of extinction has been born in Bedfordshire. If you've never heard of the bongo, it's because sightings in the wild are extremely rare. So much so that the species was only discovered in the 1960s. There are fewer than 100 of them left in the wild. Staff at Woburn Safari Park are delighted and hope the male newborn will go on to start a large family of its own. It's the first bongo calf born at the park in more than 10 years. Oh, it's very cute. Right, that's it from us. Mary will be here with the ITV Evening News at 6.30 with no doubt more news on the 10 hog sacking. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.